Advocacy is something that everybody could do, even if you don't have money of your own, and even if you don't have scientific expertise. The fact is, most people who could be in a position to support this work financially also do not have scientific expertise. So it's a case of who do they trust? Who do they want to actually look to who does have the scientific expertise and whose opinion they choose to follow? And that's the same for anyone who supports this work. They have to know, they have to have reason to believe that what I say and what Sense Foundation says is actually more credible than what the critics of what we do say. And the main reason why that's becoming progressively easier is simply because there is a constant flow of scientific expertise in our direction. More and more people signing up to be members of our research advisory board. Fewer and fewer people actually going out and denigrating the regenerative medicine approach to combating aging. Something I often like to emphasize, which I think is a really good measure of this, is that as little as five years ago, when there was still a rather poor understanding of this idea within the gerontology community, I had never been invited even to actually give a talk at a mainstream gerontology conference, despite the fact that obviously I've had a pretty high profile in the wider world for a lot longer than that. But now things are completely different and regularly, several times a year, I get invited to run entire sessions at conferences like that. So that really shows how legitimate this has now become. And if you're not a scientist and you're talking to someone else who's not a scientist, that's the sort of data that you can give them to give them a feel for why they ought to believe that this is both credible and desirable. Quite a few people have moved in our direction. Uh, so people, I mean, senior, prominent, prestigious scientists working on the biology of aging. I wouldn't say that there's all that many who have gone from being vocal detractors of this work to being vocal advocates. But there are certainly plenty of people who have gone either from being vocal detractors to being silent or alternatively from being silent to being vocal advocates. So people are definitely moving in the right direction and I assure you that nobody is moving in the other direction. ARMI at Monash University is one of a number of high profile, well funded, really prestigious regenerative medicine institutes around the world who are taking an increasing interest in the application of regenerative medicine to aging. ARMI is actually headed now by Nadia Rosenthal, one of the most prominent professors in regenerative medicine in the world, who has been one of the more vocal and um, you know, uninhibited supporters of the idea that I've been putting forward since way back, since um, getting on for 10 years now. And she has counterparts in the US, for example, Tony Atala, who is the head of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, Alan Russell, who for 10 years was the head of the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine. These are the, the biggest and most prestigious regenerative medicine institutes in the world. And all of those people who head those institutes are, you know, associate editors of the journal that I edit, Rejuvenation Research. They're members of our research advisory board. They are not just privately, but publicly supportive of the sense approach. I don't think that we actually need data, actual research progress to get more money into the development of interventions against aging. I think what we need is education of the decision makers, policy makers and people with money on what the relationship is between aging and the diseases of old age. They need to understand that treating the diseases of old age like any, old disease, like any other disease is ultimately just quixotic. It's like putting one's head in the sand because those diseases cannot be treated in that way. They are the result of an accumulating progressive change in the body, side effects of normal metabolism, of the normal operation of the body. And if one ignores that, one can never make significant progress in postponing those diseases. Therefore, the only approach that makes sense is to postpone those diseases by addressing the precursors, those accumulating molecular and cellular changes. The fact that those changes are initially harmless is an enormous opportunity. It means that we don't even have to make that repair particularly comprehensive 
in order to actually deliver a very great postponement of the age-related diseases that result from them. The other thing that is the challenge, however, is that this means it's preventative medicine. You can call it preventative geriatrics, if you like. And preventative medicine is always a hard sell, because ultimately people just don't like submitting to doctors, to, to, to medicine, especially not new medicine, when they're not yet sick. They just don't see the risk-benefit ratio in the right way. So we've got a lot of work to do to educate policymakers, but also the general public, about the value of all of this. I think that the fact that the baby boomers are reaching retirement age at this point is likely to provide a good deal of impetus to the development of therapies that really work against ageing. And of course, therefore, I think it will provide impetus to Sense Foundation's mission to develop regenerative medicine against ageing. I think especially the fact that the baby boomers in the US are very much a can-do generation, they don't like to take no for an answer, has a good chance of making their voice heard, making their voice loud and unignorable. There's not actually all that much difference in terms of the level of enthusiasm for regenerative medicine against ageing, for the sense approach, across the areas of the world that I spend most of my time in, which is basically North America and Western Europe. However, perhaps that's circular. In other words, perhaps the reason why that's where I spend most of my time, that's where I get most of my speaking invitations and so on, are those parts of the world. The parts of the world that I don't spend so much time in, especially the Far East, and the Middle East for that matter, are a long way behind the curve in understanding really the possibility that ageing could be treated as a disease. And, you know, I'm always searching for ways to help them to catch up, because I think in other ways they may very well be better placed than Western society to actually, you know, get the bit between their teeth and run with this and make things really happen faster. Kazakhstan is a really interesting example of this. The President of Kazakhstan, Nasrallah Nazarbayev, has publicly stated um, on a number of occasions that he doesn't fancy seriously getting old. He's already fairly old, he's in his 70s, uh, but he's putting money where his mouth is. There's a lot of research in this area being funded at Nazarbayev University in the capital, Astana. And they ran a conference last year in which I and a number of very prestigious scientists working in ageing and in regenerative medicine were invited from around the world to, uh, in, to discuss these things and to advise local scientists on how to move forward and make a good contribution in this area. So I think that the Kazakhstan science effort has a lot of promise in making a contribution.